tonight's class, new series, starting tonight, Bezrat Hashem, from thought to reality, a Jewish approach to manifesting your dreams. Now, I want you to know that I was very nervous about putting these classes together because the concept of manifesting in the, uh, in the, in the world today um, is backed by all kinds of pseudoscience. And what I did not want to do is I did not want to go back to pseudoscience the uh, you know the uh, El Cator, uh, the uh, the um, the secret and other books like it uh, you know that talk about manifesting. But I, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to have a conversation of uh, us looking through Jewish sources and showing you ha- from the source that you recognize from Pesukim that you are familiar with that the concept of manifesting is actually f- f- filled through all the pages of the Torah. You just kind of missed it, just like the elements are, uh, you know, uh, th- scattered throughout the whole entire Chumash in the Torah. That was the last series. Um, you'll see that this idea of manifesting uh, your dreams and your reality is very much part of the program of the Torah itself. And, um, yeah, okay, just, I'm still, uh, I'm still, I haven't stood up, and I've been sitting all day today. I haven't actually finished this first class finally. And um, I want to go through this with you uh, quickly um, and uh, because I want to get you out of here. So it's, it's late already. Okay. Midrash tells us follows, you're all familiar with this idea. Open up the door as tiny, open up your, the, the door as tiny as the eye of the needle, or open up your heart as uh, uh, that door, the tiny as the eye of the needle, and it'll open up your gates wide enough to let carts and horse-drawn wagons drive through it. Right, you've heard that idea? Like the, the, the eye of the, open up your heart like the eye of the needle and I'll do everything else. All you have to do is put in that little amount of effort, show me the smallest amount of effort on your part that you want to uh, move, and I will do everything else. Just push the button and I will make it automatic. I will do the rest of it for you. Okay? Rabbi Shlomo El Yashiv says and follows in the uh, Leshem Shavuot. He says, Moshe and Aram first gathered all the elders of Israel to inform them that the redemption before them was approaching, right? Before they went to power. They first went to the Jewish people to let them know that the Geulah is coming. This was necessary because the elders needed to, this, to be spiritually awakened first to facilitate a bestowal from Paro to let the people go. The redemption would not have occurred had the Israelites not been awakened. What does that mean? Why did Moshe need to get the Jewish people on board first before he went to Paro to get approval to let the people go? It's a weird thing. Go, go, to, go to Paro himself and then ask him, say, hey guys, by the way, I went to Paro and now you're free. Or he said no. But why are you going first to the people? And he talks about this lashon of something from below and from above. We'll come back to that. Now, let's go up to the uh, uh, Garden of Eden. Okay, the Pasuk says, And no tree of the field was yet on the earth, neither did any herb of the field yet grow, because the Lord God had not brought rain upon the earth, and there was no man to work the soil. And a mist ascended from the earth and watered the entire surface of the ground. You guys familiar with that pasuk? This is uh, right there, God talking about the creation of the Garden of Eden and all the trees in the world and so on and so forth. And if you look, turn the page very quickly over there, you quote the Rashi, who points out that Adam HaRishon came to the world, saw that all the trees were barren, right? And recognized that there had to be some kind of prayer that happened. His prayer uh, created uh, some type of movement from below. And that movement from below created a movement from above. And then all of a sudden, all the fruit trees began to sprout because it rained. And that was the first time it rained when Adam came along and prayed for the rain. This is actually a machloket amongst the, uh, some of the uh, uh, Tanaim. Uh, so, you know, do we want rain or not? Actually, this is a side note. Interestingly, uh, interesting because it hasn't rained here in so long. Even though it rained a little bit this past week, we're still in a drought in New York. The year is 2024, just so you know. Uh, we're in, uh, in November, uh, November 25th, I believe. And uh, it rained once in the last, like, 60 days. Um, and so now the question in the Gemara, this is the Gemara in Ta'anit Andaf, Andaf Chet Amud Bet. And there's a machloket there between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua, two great scholars who you've heard them argue before, specifically about when, did the uni- when was the uni- universe created? Was it created in the month of Nisan, or was it created in the month of Tishrei? So uh, I gave you a little mnemonic. You know that um, uh, Yoshua is, uh, he argues what? Nisan, right? 
and because uh, NY and um, and uh, and El Rabbi Eliezer is for Tishrei, okay, at. And uh, now what's interesting is that th- that machloket the Maral points out is actually centered on a, on a greater divide. Do you want supernatural help, or do you want to have your own ability to get up and do what you got to do? And he points out this fascinating thing. He says whenever you see a machloket between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua, you have to understand where this machloket comes from. It comes from Yehoshua versus Ezra. Yehoshua ben Nun. How does he conquer the land of Israel? All kinds of miracles. He splits the sea, he stops the sun, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, all these miracles. Yoshua means from help from above. Right? Yoshua, help from above, help from God. Where Eliezer, come the words, God will help me, but the way God helps you is when you are able to help yourself. That's right, I said help yourselves. And Eliezer, Ezra Hasofer, Eliezer comes from Ezer, Ezra, Ezra Hasofer came into the land of Israel also. He brought the Jews back after the Perm story. He took the Jews out of Persia and brought them back to their holy land, to Jerusalem. And he did it by all natural means. And the, the, the Maral points out, whenever you see this machloket, you have to remember this machloket is based on these two characters, reliving these two different, these two, two different characters, these two different individuals throughout history who are bringing about different ways of dealing with nature. Do we wait for God to split the ocean, or do I jump in? Why did God need the Jewish people, why did he need Nachshon ben Aminadav to jump into the water? He couldn't split it, we were right there. Like, come on, God, why are you making it so difficult for me? Just come on, you, you knew it was going to happen anyway. Just, just pull, the, pull, push, pull the trigger. Make it happen. Why is he waiting for us to make the things happen? Do you, do you see a pattern over here? Hello? Yes? No, I mean, listen, I think, I think that um, God, you're asking a different kind of question. God, God sets up the matrix. Our lives are set up the way it is, right? Let's go back for a second. You know, did you have a say in what the, your parents would call you? No. Right? Who said that so emphatically? <laughs> oh, you did. Uh, would you have uh, chosen a different name for yourself? Would you have chosen a uh, different uh, you know, set of parents for yourselves? What, well, think about all the things you could have, would have done differently, right? But for whatever reason, you didn't do it, right? You are given certain things. You have no choice over who you are and where you come from, okay? That's God setting up the, uh, the um, tapestry of your lives. I can't change everything that's on the canvas. I can change what goes on next. Now, what does God want from us? He creates a world of action, a world where you and I, our choices matter. And based on the action and inaction, that's what drives the forces from above to below. But it starts with an action from below. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't that part of it that like if Hashem just did things for us? What's part of it? Like part of making something happen, our hishtadlut. Yeah. Even just like consciously don't make you take a step in the direction. There's all kinds of uh, hishtadlut. And he, look, we just read earlier that the all you have to do is just start small, open up your heart, you know, the, the, in the, the eye of the needle, and God will do the rest. Okay, so yeah. you're asking like why does Hashem want us to take that step? Yeah. That's what I'm asking. Why does God want us to take that step? Why do we have to be committed to the path? Trust what? To trust him? God, you, do you think God needs you to trust him? No, he, didn't he put us on this world um, so that we don't have the bread of shame, not to give us everything without working hard? That's right, good answer. The reason why God put us on earth is so that we don't have to worry of the nama, the chusufa, the bread of shame. What's the bread of shame? The bread of shame is also known as the man. Why was the man called the bread of shame? You didn't work for it, exactly. Anything that you, that's given to you without effort or work is called shame. Shame on you. You just did that, you got that for free, did no effort, shame on you. 
You didn't work for it, a bread of shame. God creates a world where you're supposed to work for your mitziut, your reality. Your choices express your reality. And therefore, God does not want to give you freebies because he wants you to be you. Yeah. But if you manifest it, yeah. right? isn't it not working for it? You're using your mind or something to like just get something to be done. What do you mean? Like, you're saying, like, like you're just pushing, you're saying open your heart or like do something small. Like if Nachshon just stepped into the water. Yeah. Like, First of all, he did it. He had to walk all the way until... It so got his nose. It's different. The idea that it's just the, the idea of doing something is better than doing the nothing. It's like well, I think it was Wayne Gretzky who said, "You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take." What's that? Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And I think that's what the, that's that's exactly what that midrash is saying. Like you have to do something. Go do something. Something small, and hopefully that something small will lead to the consistent. Uh, uh, so it has to be one action, not it, only your mind. We say mitzvah goreret mitzvah, avera goreret avera. It's got to be an action. Something from below has to happen. Okay, and it could be that you could argue that because we're getting very, very technical over here. Is it a thought or an action? Which one is it? And the truth is that it's really both. You know, I got into a little bit of a machlok at one of the, one of the rabbis here today. We get into all kinds of theological discussions all the time. I wish we could record it. It's so fun. It's a lot of fun watching it happen. And um, I said something that, you know, he said something about l'shalol l'shma ba l'shma. Right? Just go to shul and, and, and pray, and eventually you're going to pray for the right reasons. And I said, that's not how it works. That's not how l'shalol l'shma ba l'shma works. L'shalol l'shma ba l'shma means that I want to do something, not for the right reason right now, because I don't feel it. But my goal is to get to wherever it is, A, you know, X, Y, or Z. But if you don't have that goal in mind of where you want to go, the Shalol the Shema, Baal Shema doesn't work. Shalol the Shema, Baal Shema means I want to do something, I know where I want to go, I'm not feeling it, I'm going to do it anyway. If you don't have a vision of where you want to end up, the Shalol the Shema doesn't work. It doesn't go anywhere. Will it have some kind of an impact? Yes. But it's not going to drive you the same way when, uh, when you have that clear picture in your head of what you want to actually accomplish. Okay. Let's keep going. What does it mean to be created with Tzal and Elohim? We've spoken about this before uh, a few times in these classes over here. Tzal and Elohim, how can we be created in God's image when God has no image? Harambam says, uh, God is only anthropomorphic. Right? Uh, God's image is God has no image. Harambam says, God is only anthropomorphic. We cannot uh, visualize God. God has no hand. He has no arm. He has no nose. He has got no nothing. Right? How, do, how am I creating God's image then? If God has no image. I clearly have an image. You have an image. How can we create the image of God if he has no image? So we say that God has no image. That's true. But to be created, B'Tselem Elohim means with the power of Elohim. The power to create. The power to create. What does the word Elohim mean? The, the actual definition of the word Elohim is Baal HaKochot Kulav. What's Baal? Not the, uh, the deity. What? The master. The master of all powers. Master of the universe. What does it mean that we are created masters of the universe? How are we created like the master of the universe? Top of the food chain. What? Top of the food chain. Yes, we are top of the food chain. This is true. Free will. Free will is definitely a big part of it. And I'm going to argue that that, that that is the most important. The ratzon is one of the most important muscles we all need to be working on. How do I exist? Because the whole idea of manifesting is based on your ratzon, which we're going to get to. Right? Your ratzon is everything over here. But at the end of the day, we're created like God. And how are we God-like? Yeah. Does God have free will? God? Yeah, he's got free will. No, oh. He's so good. Yeah. There's no option for him to do something wrong. Well, he created us. He created me. I understand. We made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that so was, imperfect. He created you. I wanted to say he created you, but that wasn't fair, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So um, flawless, there's no chance that they could decide to do something that's wrong. We have free will because we have the concept. The Gemara says that he created man with free will, and the free will itself is what allows us to be flawed. And the fact that he created mankind, you're going to say, well, is God flawed? No. But God can choose to do things that he regrets. How does he regret it if he's so, if he's so perfect? How does God create a generation of people? That he says, I had creating the generation of the Mabu. So, straight on Pasu. 
So free will so doesn't. So wait, so now you're saying that God forbid I don't want to say, but you can only have free will if you have a. Uh, you're saying you can't have free will mind, if you have foreknowledge. Now, if I know clearly one plus one is two, yeah, I don't have free will to decide that yeah. it's three. Right. I only have free will where. I have contradictory ideas in my mind, and I choose... You're talking about free will in a vacuum. You're talking about free... free will is like... You're talking about free will in a vacuum where you're not thinking about other people having free will. The nature of free will is that there has to be some element of free will. And therefore, God has to hold back some of his own foreknowledge so that you can have free will. Okay, so then we're introducing an idea that God has uh, multiple perspectives, and there, uh, there, the, is the, an the, element of, there is an element of dialogue with, within himself. Yeah, but the, that, this is he no, decides to be correct. All of this is true, and this is a much deeper conversation that I really don't want to get into because it has nothing. We're, I don't care. For Nobody me, wants to get there. No, no, no. Meaning, meaning, meaning do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I don't care. Like, I don't care about the God problem. Like, that's not my issue. Is me? My issue is you. My concern for this class, my concern for this class specifically, is are, are the things that are in the realm of human beings. We're, our conversation is an important conversation, but it's not for our, us right now. That conversation, another class, we'll do a whole thing on Harambam, more and Vuchim, and we'll go through how God operates, philosophical issues about dealing with God and free will and foreknowledge and so on and so forth. But not for this. This right now is manifesting. And, I, and while I think that's a fascinating conversation, I just want to stay on track. I want to talk about the idea that you and I can use our free will to change our reality and how that works. That's really what I want to get to tonight. So I want to show you in the Pasukim. So God says he creates man with Selma Elohim. Be created Selma Elohim means that he creates us with the power of creation. He creates with the power to influence things. But he's a little bit different than us. Look at Rabbi Nebachia. He says, image refers to the conceptual mold of a structure through, the, through which the creator designed mankind. Among the many aspects of his mold are the will and the ability to think, as well as the capacity to express those thoughts. The likeness of God primarily signifies that humans were endowed with the ability to understand and acquire wisdom. Both image and likeness pertain to the realm of thinking, including and uniquely the ability to be creative. So, according to Rabbi Nebachia, the whole idea of Ve'yibar uh, al of, uh, B'tzalmo Barautam, right, means that we have the power to be creative. Creativity, uh, thinking new thoughts, doing new things, changing things up a little bit, becoming something different, is what it means to be God-like. God is not stuck, right? He can do, and he's infinite, and that way you have infinite possibilities. Right now, every single one of you can make one choice that will radically change your whole entire lives forever. I can't tell you what to do, but you all know what you gotta do. Everyone here can do one thing that could radically change everything, but you're too lazy to do it. So, okay, now, just as God, number seven, Ex, uh, just as God's expression begins from his will, a thought, and then proceeds to manifest of that thought, so too does man follow the same process. First he thinks a thought, and then he proceeds to express it. We say, Sov The end of an action is the beginning of a thought. What does that mean? When God wants to create a house, how does he create a house? This is based on Nefesh Chaim. He says, very simple, when God wants to create a house, he closes his mind, he thinks of house, and pow, house exists. If I want to create a house, what do I got to do? First, I got to get a really good architect who knows the laws. Then I got to go find the, uh, the lumber yard, I got to get the lumber, I got to get people to help me. I get the per- I finally build it, you know, and then I'm told that the zoning is off, I got to do things, and then finally, after months and years of me doing all these things, I have a house. Okay, this is the difference between us and God. When God walks away from that house, the house ceases to exist. In order for me to create the house, I have to find material that's all in existence already, it's all there, and it'll continue to be there long after I am gone. God is the fabric of all creation. Man uses that fabric to bend reality, to twist reality, to create a reality around himself. But there's a process here. First, a thought. The thought leads to action. Okay? I have a machshava. Okay, the machshava goes to an asiyah, an action. 
Okay, that, that doesn't, you don't really start with an action to a thought. It doesn't work like that. There are people like that, but they're crazy. Okay. The Shulchan Ruch says as follows. He says, A person should imagine himself as being a lion when he gets up in the morning. Now, I know some of you did not have the schut of coming with us last year to uh, South Africa, but if you did, you know that lions are really lazy. And there's nothing really uh, inspiring about a lion getting up in the morning. He gets up, he stretches his legs. You know, whatever it is. And I asked my friend, like, you know, lions are really not like, you know, like, why a lion? Like, tell me something else. He says, no, he says, with the strength of a lion. And I, this is the first halakha in the Shulchan Aruch, by the way. This, 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 this little quote is the first one, uh, the first halakha in the Shulchan Aruch. How do you see yourselves in the morning when you wake up? Remember that commercial uh, from Dunkin' Donuts? That guy, what did he say? It's time to make the donuts. You know what I'm talking about? You guys don't know that commercial? Holy cow, that can't be that old. There's this old. No, so there was an old commercial of a guy who would get it. He'd be in bed, right? He had like that little beanie, like sleepy hat with a little mustache. And he'd get, you know, his alarm would go off. And he'd, like, he'd wake up, his eyes would, he's like, oh, it's time to make the donuts. And like he's just saying, it's, you should Google later, it's time to make the donut commercials. They're hilarious. Okay, and it's like a monotone, it's time to make, like, not inspired, I just got to make donuts, all the guy does is the donut guy, right? Um, that's not the way Hashem wants us to wake up in the morning. He doesn't want you to wake up, like, slow. He wants you to literally jump out of bed and roar like a lion. Why does he want you to do that? Now, how, how do you wake up out of, when you wake up in the morning, is that like a, like, um, a th- is there any thought to how you wake up in the morning? No. Is there any real practice that you've created for yourself as far as ritual, how you get up in the morning? Or you just like you just do whatever you feel like doing because that's what's convenient to you, that's what you've been doing for so long, and you never really put it any thought at all about like maybe I could change how I get up in the morning. Maybe the way if I want to have a different kind of day, I gotta think differently about how I wake up in the morning. By the way, if you wanted to start to make a change in how you wake up in the morning, where, when would you start making that change? Tonight. That means before you go to sleep, you have to say, you know, tomorrow morning, I don't want to wake up like it's time to make the donuts. I want to wake up, I want to wake up like a lion, with the strength of a lion. And therefore, before I go to sleep, I gotta imagine myself getting up and jumping out of bed. I gotta just I can't when I wake up, I gotta just jump out of bed. No alarm just jump. Two jumping checks right away. Yeah. It depends on, uh, on uh, how excited you are about life. No. What you're going through. Zelo, 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 Zelo nachon, that's my Russian Hebrew accent. Like Zelo nachon, no, no, that's not true. Uh, okay, fine. So that, that's another clue. This is, this is all part of what we're going to get to, hopefully, in the next few weeks. Yes. It's true, it's true, it's true. something Yes, no, this, you, 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 you could pump, you can totally, you can totally pump your, listen, you know what? If you really believe that making, that making donuts makes, make children happy, you know, or like it makes it like you, people, you, there, there's ways of cre- of turning that. If, if all you're doing is a monotonous, repetitive, copy, paste, and repeat, of course it's going to be boring. No, but even visualizing yourself in strength, how does that, how does that make you wake up? In the okay, so you're, it's, not, it's, it's not a one-off like, okay, I'm just going to think right now. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm just going to think right now tomorrow morning. I'm going to wake up. Line, I'm not going to set my alarm. Out. Nothing's going to happen. Put a line on your screensaver and there. So... <laughs> So there are several things you have to do to like reinforce it. There's several things you got to do to reinforce it. You know, like uh, yes, you know, uh, print a huge, like get a poster of a lion, you know, uh, over your bed. You know, get uh, it's change your uh, what's it called your alarm clock to Eye of the Tiger. So like you hear like the pumping music in the morning. Like you gotta, you gotta create a. Uh, you have to change your 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 whole morning routine to take make it different. And if you do those small few things, like you know, I'm gonna change my, my ringtone to my alarm to be like Eye of the Tiger, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm gonna change my this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get like tiger sheets, leopard sheets. I don't know. You do something crazy so that you like you live in that reality, and you'll see the change. It'll come. Okay. I, I just want to hold. I just want to keep going. Okay. So uh, we are on number nine. 
He says, V'yismach Hashem Elokim min ha'adama kol etz nechman l'ma'are v'tov l'ma'achav etz ha'ayim v'toch ha'gan v'etz ha'da'a tov ha'ra. God creates all these amazing different types of trees in the garden, pleasant to see, tov l'ma'achal, good to eat, v'etz ha'ayim, and there's this etz ha'ayim v'toch ha'gan v'etz ha'da'a tov ha'ra. Rav Tzedek HaKohen says as follows, number 10. He says, the garden of Eden sprouts forth all uh, the trees pleasing to the sight. This represents the external outward expression of a person's deeds. Good for food, he says, symbolizes the inner aspect of a person, referring to their thoughts and feelings. The comparison between food and thought suggests that thoughts are the higher and more refined form of energy intake, meaning there are people who don't eat much, and it's because they're deep thinkers. They don't have time to be eating. Okay, maybe that's one way of going on a diet. The tree of life represents the heart or the will of a person as is positioned at the center of the body. The tree of knowledge signifies a mind which discerns between good and evil. So this is not just not just a pasuk about things that are happening in the uh, garden on a physical level, because the Orachayim says number 12, we'll skip number 13, we'll come back to it. He says, so the do not view the garden of Eden as a literal garden, but rather as a spiritual concept. Why does God have to take Adam and put him into the garden of Eden to work and to guard it? Who is he guarding it from? Who is there? Who is there going to steal the uh, stuff in the garden? I understand today why you need guards because you have crazy people running around looting and whatnot. But back then, Adam, who, why did he need to, uh, to, to safeguard the garden of Eden? Why did he need to work? For Adam, this is before the sin. What? He's got to work? What does that mean he's got to work? I thought God created a world where everything was given to him already. Why, Why is Adam, before the sin, placed in the Garden of Eden to work and to guard? Yes. I'm guessing. Yes. Maybe to keep himself from like being ungrateful and bored. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe he's protecting him from leaving? Look at the Zohar at the bottom of this page. The verse is referring to a garden that has spiritual needs, just like, a, like land needs to be worked, plowed, and seeded. So too, the garden of the soul needs planting and guarding. To work represents the good deeds, and to guard symbolizes refraining from negative actions. If this is an allegory, according to uh, the Or Chaim, right, then maybe there's another layer of, of, of a messaging that God is trying to give to you. How are you protecting and developing who you are as a person? How do I know this? You'll see, if you, uh, you'll see it says over here that, um, that, look at number 13. This, this, this pasuk over here is the pasuk that prevents us from being uh, wasteful. Bal tashchit. Ketsur, ala'ir. When you wage war against the city, you have a besieged in a long time. In order to capture it, you must not destroy its trees, wielding an axe against them. You may not eat of them. You must not cut them down. Our trees of the field are human to withdraw before you into the to be right? Right? Man is compared to a tree. That's a tanit, but it's based on pasuk Man is like a tree of the field. How is man like a tree of the field? Anyone ever hear? This is a Ashkenazi uh, custom that uh, they have for young children, for boys, called Upsharon. You guys know what that is? You ever go to Upsharon? What's that? After three years. After three years old, they cut the hair. So yes, yeah, so there are other people that do, they do this also um, around the world. Some people do it at three, some people do it at five, some people do it at 12. But the idea is that we don't cut the hair because the hair is like the fruit of the field, the perot. And uh, we want this child to develop, and the cutting of the hair represents a new milestone for the child. There's rather shame when you have your children, and you have to, if you're going to do this custom, it's a beautiful custom, or if it is your custom, there's something, I can say this because I did this three times, three boys, I did this three times to my boys, and each time, the day after, they're different people. I don't know what happens. They just lose their personality, they're very serious all of a sudden, and the rain seats, see, they've got to keep on, like, who are you? Where's my cute little kid with the long curls? You know, there's something about that whole thing that changes them, right? This idea of waiting and the cutting, some, somehow it changes them. But the Zohar says as follows. He says, uh, look at number 14. Fruit-bearing trees are compared to the scholars and individuals of positive influence who should not be harmed or removed. Conversely, non-fruit-bearing trees are likened to people of negative influence from whom we are encouraged to distance ourselves. This concept is echoed in many other sources. Just as the trees begin the seeds and develop roots, branches, and fruits, so too these elements metaphorically exist within a person. How are we like trees how are you and I like trees, and how does that impact us as adults? Okay, so 
Did you ever hear the expression, uh, you are what you eat? Right? So there's another expression that, that it goes a little bit differently, is that you are what you see. Or what you look at defines, what you, your, defines your reality. What does that mean? Every interaction is an interaction that has an influence over you. And therefore, uh, every single time you find yourselves in a situation where uh, you're going to choose a particular behavior response, behavioral response, the more you choose that behavioral response, the more that becomes your default automatic response. So this is hard to explain, but I, I know if like, just like bear with me for a minute, I'm gonna try to explain this to you because you know what I'm talking about, you just forgot about it. Remember where, and, and for all of you, it's all very different, I, I think. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then just me afterwards, we'll, we'll make a session for you. Um, remember, there were certain sensitivities you had as a child where you heard people say things or do things that made you uncomfortable. And then as you got older, those sens- you're like, oh, maybe I'm just being too sensitive, and they went away. You know what I'm talking about? Anyone, anyone not know what I'm talking about? Okay. When so. You, were, you realized you were sensitive. It doesn't have to necessarily, it's not necessarily a sensitivity. There's certain things that you were sensitive to, a certain language, certain behavior, you know, and then eventually, like, it doesn't bother you anymore. Like, it kind of went away. Who says, yes? Maybe like a childhood fear also? Like that oh, no, a childhood fear is a little bit different. I'm saying it's like a sensitivity. It's not a fear. What's that? It, it's, it's not even insecurity. It's just like it's sensitivity. Like being sensitive. Yeah, like you're, you're, you're desensitizing yourself. Children have certain sensitivities, and as you get older, you can become desensitized. Like the first time you see a traumatic thing, like remember seeing Mufasa dying? Yeah. That first time? Yeah, that's true. It's horrible. And now, ah, the guy is a good idiot. The guy fell. The guy fell. You know, how can you fall? How can you f- Whatever it is. You know, it's not, it doesn't, doesn't like, there's certain sensitivities you have, and then like, they kind of like go away. Right? And now, every moment of life is a moment that has the power of desensitizing you. Every, every interaction is an opportunity to either sensitize yourself or desensitize, desensitize yourself to a particular type of behavior, good or bad. By the way, you know where this com- becomes super, super um, complicated? With our parents. Think about how we interact with our parents when we were younger versus now. Would you ever have imagined that you could speak to your parents when you speak to them now? Right? As a child? I go, wow, if you were a child watching your adult self speak like that, you'd be upset with yourself. How, who, how can you speak like that to mom or dad? Right? But we have all this baggage, and our parents are able to trigger us so quickly that we forget who we're actually speaking to. This is why months ago, when we did that whole series on Kiva Nava M, the whole purpose of that conversation was really just to spend some time saying, hey guys, there's a whole set of laws here. What are you doing to sensitize yourself to these things? But the idea over here is that trees, okay, operate in a particular way and human beings operate in a particular kind of way, okay? We are similar to trees and we're dissimilar to trees. Trees are the inverse of human beings. Trees, their uh, root of a tree is found where? Underground. Can you see it? No. All its nourishment comes from underground. You think that the leaves are catching the rays of the sun and the water, and that's where it's getting its nourishment. It's not true. It's all in the roots. Majority of the growth that happens with trees in the roots. It's happening in a place that's unseen underground. How are we like uh, trees? The root of your growth is unseen, but it's happening not from below, but from above. Your spiritual roots are tied to these uh, spiritual uh, you know, branches above you, and it's nourishing us down here. And what the thing that nourishes us from those spiritual, uh, the, the, the pulse of energy that's coming from, de- from above, below, is being fueled by your thoughts. And it's being fueled by your behavior, your action. Remember, the Gemara says, how do you know if a person's a good person? How do you test a person? There's three ways of test- testing a person. Kiso, koso, and kaso. Is that fair? Is it fair to test a person, you know, when he's upset with his wallet, you know, uh, and then how much he's drinking? Like, those are the, that's not fair. Like, you're setting the guy up for failure. Like, he's, he's drinking. Of course he's not going to be normal, right? He's going to spend a lot of money. It's a lot of pressure he's under. Why are we testing a person in those three places? He's already angry. Is that really, when you're angry, is that, is that the way I should figure out who you are? And you know what the answer is? Yes. Why? That's right. You, the truest parts of who you are is when there's no bandwidth. 
when, there's, when, 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 when all the distraction of life okay, has removed itself, and now you're running on zero, now the truest parts of you come out. You think you're a good person, I don't get mad. Ha, huh. let's see what it's like when you're in a stressful situation. That's who you really are. And the only way to change that versions of yourselves is A, to be mindful that where, where you are right now, whatever, whatever this is, this is you with maximum, maximum bandwidth. This is max, maximum bandwidth is not an expression of, 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 of your innermost selves. When there's almost zero bandwidth, because you're so stressed out at the end of the day, you're tired, you're grouchy, you're, grouch, you're hungry, all the things that are there, and you're just like, I'm in a bad mood, right? That is the, the truest expression of what you are. And you and I are here to elevate ourselves away from that to become something more. And the only way we can do that is by using our ratzon. If you don't use it, you know what ends up happening? You atrophy your will muscle. And you become a, a creature of mazal. Your mazalot define what you are. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to two years ago. Uh, in the summer, we did a whole entire series on the constellations. It's there. It's in cyberspace. It exists. Okay, Jeremiah says as follows. Yirmiyahu. He, he says, For thus God says to the men of Judah, after Jerusalem, break up the, un, uh, the untitled, untilled ground and do not sow among thorns. Right? What does he mean over there? He says, I want you to go ahead and get rid of your bad midot get rid of the bad meat that are inside of you and build on something that is good. Build on the best parts of you, not on the worst parts of who you are. How are you making that distinction between the lower parts of who you are and the higher parts of who you are? How are you highlighting the best parts of who you are and what are you doing to work on getting rid of the lowest parts of who you are? Darizel says, our lives in this world are likened to a garden or field. Our good thoughts, words, and deeds are likened to removing stones, cutting out weeds, plowing, planting, watering, and pruning our personal garden which we call the Holy Garden. And this is what the Gemara says, Are you really thinking about being the best version of yourselves? Are you really thinking daily about how, how are you pruning your gardens, spiritually speaking? What are you doing to become better, greater human beings? I go to a class once a week on Monday night, I go to one on Tuesday night, I go to Wednesday night, I go to all the classes. Going to a class does not mean anything for me. It doesn't prove anything. Going to a class is edutainment, right? Growth, thinking, internalizing, really working hard at trying to become something more is what real education is about. And I'm hoping that's why you're here. You're here because I'm not happy with status quo. I want more. You know, it's funny, like I'm, um, I give a class on Mondays in the morning uh, called uh, Sichot and Stocks. And it's like Musar and like, like conversations on like, like business and whatever it is, and like stocks and whatever it is. So um, I said something today about NVIDIA as a stock. Like its evaluation is at 3.5 billion, but I really think it's probably, it's gonna be headed to four, 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 uh, four trillion, not 3.5 trillion billion, it's gonna be at the four, four billion, right? So um, someone called me today and said, Rabbi, you know, I heard your class. I really think, it's a, I think you're making a mistake. I really think you should be thinking about shorting NVIDIA right now. Mm-hmm. I said, why? I said, you're crazy. He said, because not because of Derech HaTeva. He says, because if there's a war with Russia, and Russia goes to war right now, right? He's a very smart guy. He said, then what's going to end up happening, then China will probably attack Taiwan. And Taiwan has a company called TSMC. TSMC is like the biggest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. All of the NVIDIA chips are made there. The first thing China will do is destroy that factory. And that factory, if, that, if there wasn't that factory is destroyed, there'll be no new computers, no new phones, nothing for at least four or five years. Right? And that will tank NVIDIA's stocks. So if you want to protect yourself, you want to hedge, I would find like a short option for the next few weeks or something like like that is the most, if, if, if China is going to blow up TSMC, we've got much bigger problems than like the stock market. Like I'm not really worrying about it. Uh-huh. But the point that he was making, and then later he sent, like an hour later, he sent me an uh, article from like, uh, uh, from some German newspaper that, that the German government right now is working on uh, like a, um, of, of reevaluating this integrity, the structural integrity of their train stations to use them for like air raids as, as a place for bunkers for people to go to because it's getting that serious in Europe right now. Right, Europe is getting ready for war. The world is getting ready for war. Right? Now, I'm saying this not because I'm trying to scare you. I don't, I don't, I don't think we're going to go to war. I, think it's, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to believe that that's where we're going, because it's not going to be a fun war. It's going to be a really scary war. 
Um, World War III would be a very scary thing. Uh, the last two weeks, the needle is like actually a nuclear war, like a, like a needle that we're moving closer or further away from it. And it's, we've never been this close to like, like a nuclear war before, as far as like the possibility of it happening. Um, and I don't know what the world looks like in that kind of world. But I know this. I know that um, God creates a reality where we're given opportunities for growth. And that's the only thing that matters. And for me, it doesn't matter whether or not you grow or not. What matters is that you're trying, you're striving for growth. And striving for growth doesn't mean like, oh, I came to a class and I thought about growing right now. Striving for growth means that I actually put together some type of a plan that I'm trying to institute, I'm trying to accomplish. If there's not that in place, then you're not really trying to grow. You're sketching it. You're lying to yourselves. And you can't, we don't have time to lie to ourselves anymore. The world is changing so fast. A generator, right? Far uh, this morning gave a class about in your generations. And I said to him, you know, there's, there's a maral that says that before Mashiach comes, a generation will be every five years. And he's like, you know, like someone else told me that it's now, if you look at, you could actually look at this, look at all, like between like, you know, Facebook, from Facebook to uh, Instagram to Snapchat to like, uh, to um, the new one, what's it called? Um, TikTok. There's, about, there's a three-year gap between each one of those, and each one of those new iterations, those new platforms, represents a new generation of thinking. It's not five years. There's a new generation every, every three years now. So you could have a father and children in the same home, and everyone's completely mixed up. It's coming from a different world. It's crazy. When we were growing up, it was pretty much the same. You know, we all watched the same shows. There's reruns. There's no, nothing else. There's, you're stuck in the same stuff. But the world's changing very quickly which means that we need to be more aggressive about thinking about our own growth and our own change. Okay, I, I'm, I'm just advocating for you to remember number 17, that you are where you are because that's where you want to be. And I know it's painful to say that, right? Because why am I, I am where I am because I want to be, what does that mean? Yeah, but derech she'adam rotzei lelech molichen oto. Right, and the path that a person wants to go, that is the path that they take him on. And the question is obvious. Why does the Gemara say the path they take him on? Who's the they? Look at Rabbi, uh, uh, the, the Marsha. The question arises, who are they? Refers to the stage in the phrase, and the way that a person wishes to go, they guide him. If this principle meant that God alone leads a person in the direction that they desire, the Hebrew should have been written in the singular, in the way that a person wants to go, he leads him. However, the Hebrew is the plural form, and the answer is that with every thought, word, and action a person engages in, an angel is created. These angels are formed by one's deeds, thoughts, and speech guides them, the person along their chosen path. You are creating miniature malachim. Okay? And when you want to do something, you have a ratzon to do something, you're creating a positive angel that stands behind you with his wings and he pushes you towards it. And the more you create those positive thoughts and actions, the more those malachim you create, and the more those malachim are pushing you. And God forbid the opposite is true also. When you do the negative things, the negative angels come out, and they're the ones pushing you in the opposite direction, and now you're stuck in this tug of war. The Ramam says an angel is an incorporeal spiritual being without any physical form, capable of conveying information or delivering prophetic messages to the people. Which I would take as, hey, Maimonides, what you're really saying is that if I have the, enough malachim in the, coming from the positive sphere, I end up developing a connection to God in a very deep and profound way. Look at number 20. I'm almost finished. Uh, why Moshe first had, uh, did we do this already? Why Moshe, first, why, why Moshe first had approached the children of Israel before going to Pharaoh? Moshe asked that the children of Israel would not listen to me. How will Pharaoh listen to me? What does one depend on the other? The principle is that, that in order for there to be a bestowal from above, there must be an awakening from below. Thus, Moshe responds, if the children of Israel do not believe in me and create the necessary awakening from below, how could we expect Pharaoh to let us go? That reflects the concept of building the vessel for the light. The awakening from below forms the vessel to which God bestows his light. You can't move unless you're creating that space for those energies to come in. The Baal Shem Tov says, and the soul is clothed in the will, and the will is clothed in the, th- clothed in the thoughts. Thus, our beliefs, will, and thoughts serve as garments for the soul, shaping its expression and connection to the world. Do you understand what that means? That means that when you use your Bechira, or you don't use your Bechira, okay, that determines where you're going to end up. I'm stuck, I am where you are. Again, you are where you are because this is exactly where you want to be. You don't want to be where you are right now. You have to use your Ratzon to make the change. And because Rath Hashem, we're going to have the conversation for the next 
seven, eight weeks is going to be about how do I use the Ratzon to make the change. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that these ideas are rooted in Jewish text. Okay? It's a, a Shlomo Melech says, Tov yeled misaken v'chacham mimelech zaken v'chisil asher lo yedal od. Right? Better a poor, better a poor but wise youth than an old but foolish king who no longer has a sense of, okay, what does that mean over here? Who is the, young, the youth and who is the king? The youth is your Yetzer, your, your Yetzer Tov, right? He starts out really in the beginning, but he's not really equipped much. He's very poor. When you're a child, you don't know how to really navigate life. You make all kinds of crazy mistakes. But the old fool is the Yetzer Hara. He's been there for a really long time and does not want you to change. The old fool is a part of you that says, I'm comfortable with where I'm at, Rabbi. I'm not a quitter. I am where I am. I'm not changing. That's the old fool. The young, poor, wise child is the one with all the potential. The part of you in your, in your youth that said, I could do anything. Why did you stop believing that? Why did you stop believing in yourselves? Why did you stop believing that anything is possible? Why did you stop dreaming? Right? And that's what Shlomo Malk is saying. He's like, don't allow yourself to become the old, 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 the, the old king who's stuck in his ways, who can't make any change. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov says a person was created to have dominion over the angels. That means that human beings, thoughts, their actions, thoughts, their intentions, have a power to influence the direction of spiritual force, shaping the outcome of their lives and the world around them. You can do anything, you can become anything, but you have to want it. This is your homework. I want you to say to yourselves as follows. Last page. Today, I will strive to be mindful of the thoughts I think. Your thoughts have the power to influence your reality. Two, I will catch myself whenever I think or say can't, impossible, or hard, I'm going to stop myself. Three, I'll consciously choose to use my belief system to firm the words easy with conviction. Because of God, nothing is truly hard. I will approach every challenge with a mindset of ease and possibility. And here are some quotes for you to kind of think of. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to go through a few of them that I really liked. Um, and I, I think they're relevant to us. Find one of these if you want to print it and put it on your, over your, you know, your pocket and your phone. You want to read it to yourself and listen to it however you want to do it, go for it. Believe you can and you're halfway there. Difficulties, difficulties in life are intended to make us better, not bitter. Uh, where's that other one? Yeah. No, uh, this is Roy T. Bennett. He says, growth begins at the end of your comfort zone. We cannot become what we want by remaining what we are. Keep your face always towards the sunshine and shadows will fall behind you. Happiness is not by chance, but by choice. And then uh, lastly, uh, yeah. uh, you want to do, uh, imagination is everything. It is a preview of life's coming attractions. An idea not coupled with action will never get any bigger than the brain cell it is occupies. Dream big and dare to fail. It's always, it always seems impossible until it's done. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. These are the ideas that motivate people to want to become something more. Okay, so like, again, the idea of manifestation, yeah, it's, it's a Japanese proverb, but it's really not a Japanese proverb. It's also a Jewish proverb. Shiva Sheva Pamimi Povakam is also a Japanese proverb. Where do you think they got it from? Us. All right. Um, your homework is there. It's clear. Bezvat Hashem, next week, as we move through the series, we're going to go deeper and deeper in how we can use flex our Bechira to change our reality. But the idea is simple. You are your thoughts. And if you have negative thoughts or you have actions that reinforce negative thoughts, you've got to work on changing them. I can't do it for you. You've got to do it for yourselves. All I could do is help point these things out. And Bezrat Hashem, you are blessed with the clarity and the recognition that you have the ability of making all the change in the world. Have a great week. Bezrat Hashem, next week. Questions, comments, concerns?